feel the same way, and therefore it's okay. Uh, they enable us to enter other people's skin and look at the world through their eyes, but they cannot change. Poets are not legislators of the world. <laughs> it's probably too, too bad. Well. <laughs> Though I don't think we'd do any worse. <laughs> You're also one of the few writers who covers multiple genres. I am not one of the few writers. There is at least 40 women writers who work in multiple genres. But compared to the thousands of writers. But the, there's so many women writers who do who more than work in more than one genre. Uh, Maxine Human did, uh, Adrian Rich, Audrey Lord. Uh, I mean, there's just dozens and dozens and dozens of them. So when you have an idea for something you want to write, do you know going into it which genre in which you want to express that, that story or oh, that the, idea? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can't mistake an idea for a poem for an idea for a novel. It's like the difference between a hummingbird and an elephant. How does this genre attach? Uh, they have, telling stories has a different intent and whole attitude than writing poems. Your work, as I mentioned, has frequently broken barriers. Woman on the edge of time, the longings of women. Made. But when you said cyber, you actually mean he, she, and it. Not woman on the edge of time. The woman no, no. She isn't, isn't cyber. Oh. He, she, and it is. Well, I apologize for that. I didn't know. <laughs> it's a mistake to make. Oh. That was something. So both of those, so, Woman on the Edge of Time and Longings of Women being cult classics and he, she, and it as speculative fiction along with Woman on the Edge of Time. And that really the art of the blessing of the day came out at a time that there was a real resurgence of Jewish ritual and writing about it. So when you're writing, how conscious are you of those barriers and the capacity of your books to break through those barriers? Never think about that. Uh, I, I write out of my life, out of my activities out of everything from, you know, what, what I read, newspaper, see on television, comes over the internet, and, and all the things that don't. Are you aware when people are talking about those barriers? After no. Them? No, I mean, the, the, uh, I became very involved in Judaism after my mother's death, and my brother, had converted to Catholicism and didn't say Kaddish for her. And so I wanted to say Kaddish for her. I felt very strongly about that. But I was saying blah 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 because I grew up, my background was Orthodox. And girls did not get bat mitzvah. And I hadn't learned Hebrew. So at 50, I had to, well, it started actually about 47. It took me a few years to learn it enough. Uh, I, and then, uh, after my bat mitzvah, I was also invited to be part of a, um, a reconstructionist Sabur Shabbat project for the Sabur for Shabbat. So uh, I worked with a group of mainly rabbis writing liturgy, uh, which is used uh, in reconstructionist groups of Iran, uh, some reform. Uh, congregations and in, in Great Britain in lib what they call liberal, which is somewhere between Reconstructionist and Reform. Well, that's a good segue to, I, I was going to ask you about Judaism impacting your writing authority, kind of answered that. So I think what we all really want to know is, what does Passover at your house look like? Uh, Passover is not in my house. It's gotten too, very, it's gotten too big. Uh, we were packed, we could only get 15 people into the dining room. And generally, the seders I've got, like the one I'll be doing this Friday, well, it's smaller than usual, it's 23, but it gets bigger than that, because sometimes some people are third generation coming to it. Uh, last year, someone came from London, <clears throat> people came from New York, Chicago. Uh, you know, people come to this. I've been working on a Haggadah for 30 years. And Friday I'll conduct the Seder. Everyone will read it. I, I change it a bit every year. It's sort of, oh, probably two-thirds poetry by now. Uh, and I'll cook for it all day <laughs> before. 
But fortunately, since it moved to the fire chief's house, it was a much bigger house, and we needed one a huge combination of room and dining room, so we can set up all those tables for the people. I don't have to clean up anymore. <laughs> oh, I like that. That's the best part. Right now we're in Cape Okay, so now I want to give a chance to some of our audience. I want to open it up to questions. Lee Scott's coming over with a microphone for people who have questions. Wanna raise your hand? Scott will come. Just stand up. You're not in class. Just stand up and take a breathing. Questions for Marge? Just stand up. Here we go. Uh, uh, I don't have a question for you, just a couple of questions. Give him the mic. Thank you. I came to poetry late in life. I wrote my first poem when I was fifty. And I remember I got a contributor's copy. And it was co-review. And on the cover it said, Poems by Marge Piercy. It was the first poem I'd ever had published, and I thought, I'd made it. <laughs> and I should have quit while I was ahead. Years ago, I uh, was in San Francisco. And I called a friend, Tom Gunn, uh, who's a white poet from the San Francisco area. And he met me in a coffee shop. And we began to talk about poetry. And within just a few minutes, he said, well, really, here's all you need to know. And he reached into his briefcase, and he brought about three, three of your books out. And he said, just start reading these, and you'll learn more than you could anywhere else. And I thank you for bringing so much liveliness uh, to your reading. It's, it's not seen that often, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Don't be shy. <laughs> there we go. There we go. When you were first starting out, did you have trouble finding a publisher for your work? Oh, uh, my poetry got published uh, pretty early. It started being published in college, but my fiction could we could not publish serious writing about women's lives until the women's movement had begun to change things. You simply couldn't. The only way I got my first novel, I'm sorry. The only way I got my first novel and my and, uh, published or and the way I got into the parish review, etc., was by writing mail in mail in the point. Got another question over here. Coming to you. Just stand up <laughs> so I can see you. Okay, I'm Joanne Lewis and I volunteer at Humane Society with Linda. You what? We, we volunteer at the Humane Society with kitties. So I liked your poem about euthanizing. We don't always want to know what happens. Most of the cats get homes. But what's your relationship with cats? That's because I like them. And then, of course, people don't understand when they bring it into regular shelters that the cats are mostly euthanized. Millions of cats and dogs are euthanized that way. And but you don't I'm take sure. stray cats or community cats into shelters. TNR is what is required. Trap, neuter, release. Yes. For the that feral solves cats. the problem of overpopulation. For the feral cats that are... Yeah, for feral cats. Yes. Uh, but what's your I, I support no-kill shelters. I'm on the board yes. of one. Uh, I, I support and give money to another four or five. Uh, no kill shelters. And then places like Best Friends in Arizona who proselytize all over and try to reach zero euthanization in various cities. They're doing very important work. Ever have any dis did you have any discouraging experiences in the process of your creativity? Are you kidding? <laughs> Tell us about that. I, I must have had 
uh, that I got rejected time and time and time and time again. And how did you react to that? I'm still uh, I was I was an, an organizer, so I was I was very involved politically. So I had something else that could carry me <laughs> on for a while. I was a pretty good organizer, actually. Do you get your idea for a word to go on for a poem? Or do you sit down and think of, maybe I'll do it now, or are you walking around and all of a sudden something answers you? How does it begin? Uh, the poems, you mean specifically? Yes, it can come from anything. The genesis doesn't matter. Uh, but the poems can come from a rhythm that's in your head. They can come from a, uh, a, an image. They can come from a phrase. They can come because somebody asked you to write a poem about something. Uh, you, sure, all poets write occasional verse if they are professionals. Uh, you're glad somebody wants a poem. Uh, they come out of your own life, they come out of the life of friends, they come out of the life of people you can't stand, they come out of life of, out of the newspaper, out of television, out of the internet, out of, out of looking out the window, they come out of taking a walk in the woods, they come out of gardening, they come out of noticing climate ch change, uh, they come out of deciding how you want to be buried, for instance. I'm very involved in green burial now. Now, of course, traditional Jewish burial is green burial. But if you don't live near a cemetery that does that, and I live out, way out to sea, uh, I've found a way to do it in an old family cemetery uh, that's not under state control, state laws. Uh, green burial means just putting your body in, not polluting it with carcinogens if, it, if you go through an undertaker. And cremation pollutes. If you ever stood as you stand near a crematorium, you see this awful black smoke coming out. So green, uh, green I, I care a lot about the environment. So to me, to be wrapped in a shroud and put in the earth is just perfect. I we think I've made good organic things for the worms. We have a question over here to your right, Marge. What? Marge, it's me, Laura. <laughs> it's me, Laura X. It's me, what? Laura X. Oh, oh your pen pal. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. How are you? Oh, my goodness. I, to see you is wonderful. <laughs> to put a face on all those messages. <laughs> We're on this uh, together. Um, so, in honor of our uh, notorious past as women's liberationists, organizers, we were always supposed to, as Gloria Steinem would say, uh, turn every meeting into a political organizing meeting by making announcements. And I have just fallen in love with something I think you all might get a big kick out of. And it's called the Peace Train. Does anyone here know about the Peace Train and can tell this story better than I since I've only known about it for a week? No? Okay, good. Um, okay, so once upon a time, in um, the period when Mandela had just gotten out of prison, there was a music therapist in South Africa, a South African woman, named Sharon Katz. And she had the brilliant idea in the midst of this civil war of getting a choir of children from all of the multiple colors of people in South Africa and having them travel from city to city on a peace train. This is incredibly courageous and daring and it worked. So there was a documentary here in St. Louis shown at our International Film Festival, which I couldn't recommend it more. Um, and of course, don't miss the Jewish Film Festival in June. Um, but, which I also adore, but at that festival, this documentary so inspired so many people in this town that we didn't, any of us know what to do, but one person did, and she said, we need to have a police train in the United States, and I live 10 minutes from Ferguson in Florence, in Florissant, and I'm an actress and a singer, and we need to make it happen, and they said, we will help you, the people 
from South Africa. So it's happening, and, and St. Louis is the kickoff city, and uh, this very, very Friday, there will be the auditions for, excuse me? I think you might want to Yeah, I know, I'm just stating the dates, I'm sorry. Everybody get your pencil out. At Crosswords School, this Friday will be the auditions. Um, the uh, VP Parade will have the finale be these children. Um, and then at the, the kickoff concert will be um, at the Missouri History Museum on the 6th of July. So, um, what else do you need to know? Well, you need the website. I think other people probably want to say something. No, I'm done. I mean, just want to say what the website is, right? Thank you. Um, unless anybody has a question. It's um, getonthepeacetrain.org, and it's been put on by Marty Casey of Shelby Arts Academy. Okay. Sorry, it's a long question. Get time for one more. One more question. Speaking of poetry about people you can't stand, should we anticipate one about Donald Trump? There already is. Republicans. <laughs> An embryo is precious. A woman is a vessel. A fertilized egg is a person. A woman is indentured to it. An embryo is sacred until birth. After that, he or she is on their own. <laughs> Abortion is murder. Rape incest are means to an end. The precious fertilized egg housed in an expendable body. Let us make babies and babies and babies. Children are something else. Probably future criminals. Probably welfare cheats whose education hikes taxes. You can freely dispose of them. To end this abortion week. So it's getting a little late. And we want to save some time for March to sign books and for all of you that would like to eat. There's some dessert and coffee and tea over there. We do have two of March's books available for sale tonight. 